and I've highlighted uh, four works that I also use for this um, course. And uh, yeah, these three and the last one here. As it is difficult for you at the moment to to get these books, I will try to send you some of them, but uh, this might be complicated because um, they're, they're relatively big. So I will try that and um, yeah, you will see <laughs> what's, what will happen then. So this is the book of Spence. Oh, that fast, really? Interesting. So please try if you can download it, if that really works. I also can send you the book of Krak and Ormeling. <laughs> Strange. The first book. It just just took a few seconds, uh, and that one also is larger, but not so much larger. It seems to take much much longer. Please, uh, if you cannot hear me or if you cannot see my screen, please send me some feedback. So please uh, type in some some words that there are problems. I need some feedback then, otherwise I don't know. So in another course it happened that I I talked for several minutes and uh, nobody could, could hear me. So um, of course we should try to avoid that and I need your help for that. So it takes some time, but uh, it seems to work at least. I don't know of the book, the book of Spence, information visualization, if uh, it's really there, if you can really download it, because um, it was so fast, but maybe we were just lucky. I wait with the third book because uh, it's maybe not a good idea to to disturb the upload of the second book. In the meanwhile, do you have any questions so far about the first homework, the group work, or about the organization of this course? So again, you can ask me anytime, but please also here during the course, during the lesson, please write down your questions in QQ. So I cannot hear you. I cannot see you. I just see the text you type in. So that's uh, important. But uh, if I start, or after I have started the PPT, the PowerPoint slides, then I cannot see if you write something. I only see that then uh, during the break. Therefore, I will start now with the PPT. And uh, yeah, let's hope that this works.
just a moment. I organize my screens here because um, and I can see also the QQ window. That means I see about the process of the download or better, better to say the upload. It's not the download. And also I can see if you write me anything. So that's better. So the last time I finished uh, with this slide here, our vision, our evolution. So you remember there were certain tasks and certain situation in our evolution that were especially important. Searching, face recognition, identification of green objects. Therefore, we are more sensitive in this green area of the spectrum, the green part or the green range. Also, fight or flight, threat recognition. So in the outer parts of our field of view, we are more sensitive to movements. So if something moves from the side, into our field of view, immediately notice that. So this has to do with our evolution and motion detection reaction. This has exactly to do with that. Sense integration also, we are not talking here about other senses, but of course they also play sometimes an important role when it comes to visualization. Just think about someone who is blind and uh, uses his or her touch sensitivity, the haptics of objects. So there are these three dimensional uh, plans of buildings and cities that blind people can use. And they can also develop a kind of visualization in their mind of these areas or objects. That's quite interesting, but uh, it's uh, out of the scope of this course. And also that we can we can memorize a lot of things uh, that we have seen. So our visual memory is very powerful, more powerful than our memory that is um, related to other senses. Now, today I want to start with uh, a chapter about optical illusions. In part, they play a role in visualizations as well. I will show you some examples. And another reason why I want to talk about this topic is that the uh, optical illusions, they help us also to understand our visual system. I talked last week about uh, the visual system, the eye and also the eye brain connection. So the further processing of um, the visual input and also the difference between uh, bottom-up and top-down processes. You will see this is also important to understand different kinds of optical illusions. I've used uh, several sources here. This um, work of uh, Clark. I hope these um, addresses are still correct and um, also Wikipedia. And then there are some special sources about illusions that are quite interesting. This one you can also find online. And um, this one, and uh, the last one is from, from Germany, it's in German. But uh, I also used some examples from there. So what, what are optical illusions? An optical illusion is a perception of a visual stimulus that represents what is perceived in a way different from the way it is in reality. So we have a different impression, an impression that is not the same as what's really going on out there in reality. Therefore, we can say it is a false or alternative interpretation of an object or figure presented to the eye, also called visual illusion. 
So these are synonym words, optical illusions or visual illusions, that, that is the same. Optical illusions are important to study the traits of our visual system and to better know when we have to be careful with what we think is reality. So sometimes we cannot or should not trust our senses. We have to think twice. Is this really what's going on in reality or is it an illusion that is created by our mind, for example? Gregory in 1991 described three classes of visual illusions. Physical illusions, physiological illusions, and cognitive illusions. First of all, physical illusions. A typical example is the so-called Fata Morgana or mirage. That's a physical illusion based on bent rays of light because of air layers of different temperature. So this is something that is in the physical environment, in the reality. Here's an example. So here is a kind of, it looks like a flying object, a U UFO, unknown flying object, uh, but this is a, a mirage. So it's uh, because of the different layers here, the different layers of air, they maybe they are more, some are more humid, some are more dry, some are warmer, some are colder. And these different air layers, they cause um, this illusion. It's a kind of reflection of, so there is an object somewhere behind it, but it looks then distorted and it looks like a flying above the horizon. So maybe it's a boat on the sea, but that's of course hard to say. And here is the principle. So there might be a, a sailboat in this example here. You have different layers of air and uh, these uh, lines of sight are then, they are bent. So bent rays of light and therefore you get a different impression. For another example, a diagonally placed straw in a glass of water appears to be misaligned or broken. So every, everyone, has, everyone has seen that before. So this is a straw and here it seems to be broken. In fact, two times, even here it seems to be broken a bit. And here uh, the water surface is the same. And uh, yeah, of course, this has nothing to do with our eyes. It has nothing to do with our minds. This is, um, is created by properties of the physical objects. Therefore, these are physical illusions. Situation is different with physiological illusion. So while physical illusions only depend on the external physical stimulus, physiological illusions are the result of certain traits of our eyes or the visual pathway, mainly bottom-up processes. There are several examples. I will show you some of them. The cafe wall the after image, simultaneous and successive contrast, crispening, chromatic aberration, the P phenomenon, and the better movement. This is the cafe wall illusion. It's simply named that way because uh, the person who described it first saw such a uh, structure 
such a pattern on the wall of a cafe uh, in England. And therefore it is named cafe wall illusion. You maybe have seen such examples before, quite likely, I guess. And um, of course, these lines here, they are parallel. But to our mind, they seem not to be parallel. They seem to be distorted. Or here, that's an example for the after image. This is the national flag of Italy. And if you look at this flag for, let's say, 20 seconds, you can try that. Just focus the point in the center here. Just focus on the center of this flag. Just focus there, just the center of the flag. I wait for 20 seconds. Just concentrate on the flag. And then if you close your eyes, you should see this kind of after image and it should look like that one. So this is what you should see now in your mind. And you can also do this the other way around. So if you focus on this image here for 20 seconds, then you would see the Italian flag. You can try that later. I want to go on. It's just another example for a physiological illusion. Another one is the simultaneous contrast illusion. And this one is especially interesting also for us because it plays an important role in visualizations. This square here in the center, it always has the same gray tone. But if the surrounding square is white, this square looks darker. If the surrounding square is black, this square looks brighter. So it's uh, the first moment it's hard to believe that these two have the same gray value, but they have. So this is called simultaneous contrast. So it's the simultaneous contrast between these two areas in these two areas. So there's an influence here between foreign background or between neighboring areas. Also here, you can see that. Or in these examples here. In fact, here, this gray tone on the text white here is darker than this tone here on the, on the word black, which is hard to believe in this version of the image. But here only the gray values are shown in front of a white background. So you can compare them and you see that these are darker ones. And the most fascinating example you can see on the next slide. I really, I could not believe that when I've seen that the first time. So the areas A and B have the same gray value. Interesting, isn't it? And hard to believe. <laughs> Here you see that. If you connect the two, then you, after a few seconds, you really realize that these areas have the same 
gray value. So when I go back and forth, you see there is no change in the areas A and B. So there is no trick here. It's just a physiological illusion. Another one that is related to the simultaneous contrast is the simultaneous chromatic contrast. So now it's about color, not just gray values. And you see that also the impression of color is uh, influenced by its uh, neighbors, the neighboring colors. So here, if you compare these green areas in the, in the, in the left side on the right hand side, they look quite different, although they are the same. So they are influenced by the neighboring colors, uh, yellow and blue. So here you have more blue and less yellow. And here it's the other way around. Or here you have uh, a comparison between these four areas. And you see they are they are also in part the same. So areas A and D, A and D are in fact identical. But not the letters. So the letters are not have not the same gray tone, but the areas here are the same. And here is an example of a visualization. So here is uh, Greenland and here is a uh, part of, of Canada, Eastern part of Canada. And um, the problem here is that if you use a lot of gray tones in the visualization and you have also larger areas that are uh, bright or dark, they might influence the neighboring areas. Therefore, it's very hard to decide which areas in this uh, image here belong to which of those um, parts in this um, in this legend here. So you have here from dark to nearly, but it's not black, let's say it's dark gray. To, to very bright gray, nearly, nearly white. You have here many, many different uh, small differences. And it's uh, impossible to, to use this in a visualization. So to identify single gray tones in this visualization, it's impossible. So if it is necessary to identify single tones, you should never use more than just four four gray tones. So keep that in mind. If you just want to raise the impression of a nearly continuous tone sequence, then it's no problem. The problem starts if you should identify them. If you should identify single tones, that's important. Then don't use more than four. Four is the limit. Yeah, this is a successive contrast illusion. And um, this has also to do with the, the after image. So successive contrast occurs when the perception of currently viewed stimuli is modulated by previously viewed stimuli. So by an after image, in fact. For example, Staring at the dot in the center of one of the two colored disks on the top row for a few seconds and then looking at the dot in the center of the disk on the same side in the bottom row makes the two lower disks appear to have different colors for a few moments, though they have the same color. So you, if you focus here on the left, 
it's like more orange colored disc or here the green one you can choose one if you focus this black dot for 10 seconds let's say and then you look at that disk below you will see that the color is altered it's modified changed it's not the yellow disk that you saw before now there is a mixture of the after image in your mind like with the uh, example with the italian flag so this after image is mixed with the new impression the new um input for your for your visual system and this is called the successive contrast illusion because you look at something in succession that means one after another in a sequence interesting is this uh, phenomenon here the contrast crispening In the first part here, A, all these gray strips are the same. Perceived differences between grayscale values are enhanced where the values are close to the background gray value, an effect known as crispening. That means if you compare these four strips here, they are, again, they are identical, but you have quite different impressions. So you see more differences if the, the contrast between the strip and the background is low. So here, the background is bright here and dark here, and here are middle tones. So the bright, the bright background here gives you a better impression of the bright different tones on the strip. So you see more differences here than you see here. Also the strip is the same, but here you see more differences here. That means with a lower contrast, you see more differences, which is not what we usually expect. We always expect that the highest contrast is the best. That's not true. It depends on the situation. And also here in the middle, if the background and the strip are similar, you see more differences. Same is true here. If you compare this part with that part, you see more differences here because the background and the foreground, the background and the strip are more similar. And this is called crispening a quite interesting phenomenon. And here in BCD, the differences in the grays of the gray lattice are more evident in C than with either the white B or the black D backgrounds. So if you compare here, these um, different gray values, and you see the differences here are strongest. Here they look more similar and also here they look more similar. Here they look all darker, here they look all brighter. And here they are better differentiated because of this crispening effect. So here it's clear this is darker, brighter, darker, brighter. Here it's more difficult to see that difference. This is meant by this uh, crispening contrast, or contrast crispening, better to say. That's another important one, chromatic aberration. This sounds a bit strange. Again, if chroma is in the term, then it has something to do with color. 
and the chromatic aberration is about effect of different wavelengths of light, uh, which have, have different focal lengths. You see that here. So you have the, the lens in our eyes and the, the light consists of all the different wavelengths. But of course, if you look at a certain color, then only a part of this wavelength is, um, what to say, um, reflected. And then when the different wavelengths pass through our lenses, they split. And this has the effect that the focus, the distance here is different. So for the blue rays, the focus is here, the focal point. For the green is here and for the red is here. And this differences, this difference is greatest between blue and the red because they are at the, at the two ends of the spectrum that we can see, that our eyes are sensitive for. And the effect that you get, you see that here. If you look at the screen right now, which is quite likely the case, um, you will see there is a kind of flickering effect. It's like that you see a thin black line between blue and red. But this is because these are complementary colors. And this flickering effect, so that it, it looks a bit unstable, this is caused by chromatic aberration. This is caused by this difference in the focal length between blue and red. If you choose other colors like here, a yellowish green and a bit dark yellow background, you don't have this effect. So no flickering here, but a lot of flickering here. And you should always keep that in mind. Unfortunately, I often see presentations, sometimes even of high-ranked professors and uh, highly experienced people, but they are highly experienced with their subjects. They're not so highly experienced with visualization, obviously. So we, if you want to uh, be experts in that field, we have to know about that. So we should never use blue text on red background or red text on blue background. This is especially true for all visualizations on displays or on TV, on monitors. It uh, also, it, um, you can see this effect if it's um, projected. So we are a beamer, for example. So if I would present this PowerPoint to you in class, you would still see that. But if you look at it on screen, it's even stronger. It's less strong on paper. So if it's printed, the effect is not so strong, but it's still there. So you should always avoid combining these two colors. The next one is um, an illusion that is created by movement. So it has to do with animation. This is called the phi phenomenon. It's the optical illusion of perceiving a series of still images when viewed in rapid succession as continuous motion. So what we see here is we think that this, this point or this disk moves around counterclockwise. But in fact, only each of these disks are blinking, so it's on or off for a short moment. And uh, But this is done in succession. And therefore, we get this impression of a movement. And the illusion 
of motion caused by animation is thought to rely on better movement and a phi phenomenon, but the exact causes are still unclear. So this now is another kind of movement. This is called the better movement. And here you see there is also kind of movement, but the situation is different. So better movement is an optical illusion whereby a series of static images on a screen creates the illusion of a smoothly flowing scene. This occurs when the frame rate is greater than 10 to 12 separate images per second. So again, it's just a disk that is shown for a moment and then is not shown for a moment. But it's created in a succession so that you have a of a movement. Here, this movement now, it seems to be clockwise. The other one was counterclockwise. And uh, this, these two illusions, they are related to animation and how we use animation in visualizations. So it's, um, it is thought that uh, this movement in animation, this motion, relies on better movement and the phi phenomenon. It's interesting that it's still not completely clear what's really going on in our minds, in our visual system. The next, this is the, the third group now. This is about the cognitive illusions. And the cognitive illusions are assumed to arise by interaction with assumptions about the world leading to unconscious inferences. That means top-down processes play a decisive role. So interaction with assumptions about the world means interaction with knowledge we have already, interaction with some of the contents in our memory of our past experiences, they come into play here. And therefore it's top down. So what's in our mind influences what we think we see. And so an illusion is created. There are many examples here, the bi-stable figures, and there are several examples named after the researchers who described them first. There is the Müller Lyer illusion, the Baldwin illusion, the Ebbing House or Titchener illusion, Del Boeuf illusion, Yastro illusion, Pogendorf illusion, Ponzo illusion, Sander illusion, the vertical horizontal illusion, the Ehrenstein illusion the Camisa triangle, watercolor illusion, impossible figures, the spinning or silhouette dancer, and also some examples that um, are related to animation stand, Troxler's fading and the lilac chaser. First, well-known, examples, the so-called bi-stable figures. Bi, again, this means it has to do with uh, two. There are two things, like again, in the bicycle, the bicycle has two wheels, a monocycle has just one wheel. So bi-stable means there are two stable figures, although you see only one. Or not, not to see, you see two, but <laughs> there is only one. So a very common, well-known example is the so-called Necker cube. And um, it's bi-stable because you can see this area is nearer to you, and then the other one is in the back. Or you switch, then you see this one in front of the other, and this one is in the back. 
and therefore also you have a different direction. So if this is in the foreground, then this line is here in the foreground and then to the background. And if you see the other area in front of you, then these lines leads from foreground to background, from foreground to background. There are many other example, examples. This is uh, Rubin's vase, where you can see faces, here two faces, or you see the vase. You see, it depends here, the face is, uh, the, the vase is more pronounced and therefore it's harder to see the faces. Here it's easier to see the faces. So it depends of course also on how these images are drawn. That's another famous one. The young girl looking in this direction. So this is ear, nose, eye, hair. So the girl looks in this direction. And then there is an old lady. Then the ear of the young girl is now the eye of the old lady. This is the old lady's mouth. And the old lady is looking to the left. And this is the old lady's nose. So you can switch between these two. My girl and her mother, do you see both? That's a newer one, interesting. So you can see this person like a front view, so the person is directly looking at us. Or you can switch and see the person looking to the side. Also the position of the eye is not so perfect, also not the ear, but still it, it works somehow. Or here you have Again, you have a tree and two faces. So it's a bit similar to the Rubin's ways, the idea, but here the two faces are in the, in the tree. And here, that's an example that shows um, that it's even possible to see faces sometimes in maps. So this is a map, an outline of Idaho, the US state of Idaho. And uh, here, this looks also like a face. It's a nose, eye, mouth here, maybe a beard. And um, yeah, that's more funny. But um, it's, uh, these are popular examples of bistable figures. So this has to do what we expect to see. And therefore, it's top down. Let's have a break here. And I will try to download the third, no, to upload uh, the third book for you.
So, sorry, I need a bit more time. Um, yes, a few words about these books. So these three books I've sent to you and I hope you can download them. Uh, they are kind of additional source and additional, um, additional information, background, further information um, to the materials I use in this course. Some of the materials are taken from these books, others are not. But it's important to say, to prepare for the exam, you don't need these books. I better write it down. So only the files named VOSI, VOSI examination materials are relevant for the final exam, only those. Of course, feel free to use these books if you're interested. You are highly welcome to do that if you have the time. Um, the first two, Spence and Clark Ormeling, they are easier um, to be read. A bit more difficult is the book of Colin Ware. But nevertheless, it's very interesting. I've used some of the materials, some of the figures, some also some of the text of this book, especially when it's about perception related uh, content. So then I want to return to the third part of the optical illusions. So we are in the third part of the cognitive illusions. The next example, the Müller liar illusion. Maybe you have seen that one. So you have these arrow like structures, lines with uh, arrow heads. And uh, yeah, these two. Just 
moment. So these two distances here, that one and that one, they are exactly the same. But of course, the illusion works because we think this line is shorter than that one here. And this is a nice example where this uh, illusion is used to trick our senses. So here are these two lines, that one here and that one here, they are the same. So the length is the same. But of course, this one looks much shorter. Another one is the Baldwin illusion. So here the distances are also the same, but with the squares are different in size, it looks shorter if those squares are larger than here. So we think the line is longer here than that one, which is also quite interesting because um, this easily could be important in a visualization of spatial information as well. And also this in this uh, one here. But usually it's not important here to measure these distances or to get the exact impression of their length. But here this might be important. Depends on the data and how data is visualized. Another one is the Ebbinghaus Titchener illusion. Here, the two orange brownish toned uh, discs here, they are of the same size. But of course, we have a different impression. So if larger discs are around, it looks smaller than if small discs are around. And here is an example from a, a map-like situation where this context here the context, the surroundings of other disks or circles might influence our impression. So B and A are of the same size. But if you look at a map that looks uh, yeah, like that one, that example here, it's uh, quite likely that we underestimate B or overestimate the size of A. And uh, the reason is this Ebbinghaus or Titchener illusion. So A and B here are the same, and like here, the two um, in this orange brownish color. Two other illusions. First, uh, the birth illusion. It has also to do with circles. You see here, these two should be the same as well as these two. Uh, but the surrounding circle changes our impression. This is also quite interesting because we see uh, similar visualizations relatively often. And here also this uh, circle, this brownish circle is always the same, but uh, it looks quite different. So sometimes it looks larger, sometimes it looks smaller, depending on the context of the other circle. Or here, you have additionally an uh, effect of the colors. So remember, there was this example of the chromatic aberration, red and blue should not be used together. And here it is used to highlight this effect, additionally highlight this effect of the Delbeuf illusion. Another one is the Yastro illusion. Maybe you have played with such uh, toys. At least you have seen it, I guess. And it's, uh, it's very simple, but at the same time, it's somehow fascinating because um, we think that these two tiles are different. This one is smaller than that one, but it's not true. They are the same. So here you have um, 
in color the different lines. And the red line here is the same as the red line here. The same is true for the violet one here or the blue ones here. So they're all, all the same. So it would be possible to move that on that. So put one over the other and you would see they are exactly the same. That's the just illusion. And we can also think about that in a map setting. You have uh, circles within other circles, and you have this kind of um, sectors of circles, then these uh, illusions come into play and might uh, change the impression that we have of these uh, diagrams. Another one is the Poggendorf illusion. So this is about the continuation of a line that is interrupted. So if you look at that, you might think maybe these two lines are collinear, but in fact, the other two are. And uh, here it's also funny because um, these two are, in fact, they are the, the same the same setting, but um, the impression is totally different if you add such such points here, such dots. They are blurred a bit, and um, if you put them here, then you have the impression that these two lines are not collinear. But if you put them here and you, you turn it, then it seems to be collinear. So it has an influence on how we perceive the situation. So here, we are not sure if it's collinear and here also, but here the effect is stronger and here the effect is weakened. So there is nearly no effect. And this also might play a role in a map setting when we have different lines, connections, lines uh, crossing each other, um, it's not a strong effect. So usually we don't have a problem with this in maps, but um, it depends on the situation. Another one, the Ponzo illusion. So these two plaque uh, rectangles, they have the same length. Or the thunder illusion. So here, these two lines, these blue lines, it's dark blue. I don't know if you can see that. But these two lines have the same length. And the vertical horizontal illusion. These two lines have the same length. Here is a proof, but of course uh, you can uh, check it out by yourself if you like. So we have the impression that the vertical line is longer than the horizontal line. This has to do with our experience when we look at the three-dimensional scene, and that's what we're doing in reality all the time then if a line, that something that seems to be, or has raises the impression of a line that's vertical, then usually it's something that runs away from us, for example, like a railroad. So we think it's a long distance there. But if it's horizontal, we think it's, uh, it's stable. So there is no difference in, in depth. And if there's no difference in depth, uh, we have the impression that this is the, the fixed size. And here, somehow unconscious, we add, we add something. And this comes from our experience. And therefore, it's a top-down, a top-down process where our mind influences what we 
seem to seek. The next one is the Ehrenstein circle illusion. That's a, a simple one. We simply, we, we think we see a circle here, but there is no circle. Therefore, it's an illusion. Similar is the Kanisa triangle illusion, where we see also a triangle here, and we see a triangle here. So it seems that there are two triangles, but they are not. Just lines and the sectors of uh, circles. Another interesting illusion is the so-called watercolor illusion. And uh, it's interesting, if you take a look here, it's also called a watercolor effect. That is an optical illusion in which a white area takes on a pale tint of a thin, bright, intensely colored polygon surrounding it if the colored polygon is itself surrounded by a thin, dark border. What is meant here is that you see here, you see white, black, white, black, but if you take a closer look, there are thin green lines here, and here are thin red lines. So the horizontal ones, there are thin green lines added, and the vertical ones, thin red lines. And if you take a closer look, you have the impression that these white areas here, they are slightly green. And these vertical white areas here are slightly red. So they kind of um, are, they are um, influenced by the thin color lines near to them. So altogether, you would, would say here is, this area is more reddish and this is more greenish here, if you compare these uh, different squares here. And this uh, has a practical effect or can be used in visualizations as a practical effect. So here, for example, or here. It's, um, yeah, you can guess what kind of areas we, you see here. So these are not just uh, any kind of lines. So these are coastlines. So these are actual areas on our globe. And uh, maybe some of you notice what area this is or where this is. So this here is uh, Great Britain and Ireland, a part of Great Britain and a part of Ireland. And um, this is part of the Atlantic Ocean, also this here. And here, this is the Mediterranean Sea. So here is Italy, Greece, Turkey, here is Spain, here is France, and so on. This is the Black Sea. And you see that this uh, illusion, it works. So you have a thin, dark, yellow or bright brownish uh, color here. And the whole area, the sea area, takes on such a bright, pale version of this color. So that here, this area looks slightly darker than this area here, because there is this black line also. So if you, you need both, you need the, the color and the black line, both. Otherwise, it would not work. And the, the black line somehow blocks this side, so the effect is only on the other side. And this helps, of course, to see where is sea and where is land. So here, for example, it is switched, these two, and you see that the effect. So if you are kind of trained 
to think that the big darker area is the sea, then this one is confusing. Or you're trained the other way around, that the sea is brighter, then this is uh, the one you would prefer. It depends on what you expect. But it works in both directions, the effect. Here, you, this looks darker, and here, this area looks darker, because the position of the color and the black line are reversed between the two. And the same works, of course, here for the Mediterranean Sea. So in my, in my opinion, this um, here, the land part, it, um, it looks more physical with this effect. So I would prefer C over A. This looks more like an open space. And this uh, like a solid area for me. I don't know how your impression is, but um, I would prefer C and D over A and B. But of course you can try that with a, a bluish tone then it would be the other way around, because then here you would have a, a bright bluish tone in the sea, which is a, a typical association, of course, with, with water. And here in this um, pattern, triangle pattern, you can also see the effect if you reverse the two colors, and then um, some of the triangles look more physical. So like they look more like foreground or they look more like background. And this then uh, is reversed in the other version. So here for me, this triangle here is more in the foreground because here you have this uh, pale color effect. And here is the other way around. So here this triangle looks to be part of the background. And this is the foreground. So we can influence this uh, foreground background impression with this effect. Or here, if you think about this uh, situation here, and um, if you want to know when you start here, if you will reach the cross at the end or not, it's a bit complicated. But if, if you use the watercolor effect, then you immediately know that you will not reach this uh, X or this cross in the center if you start here. Then the whole object, it looks now physical. Also inside, it looks like having a bright gray tone, but this is just based on the watercolor illusion. So it has to do also with, with shading effects or three-dimensional representations, for example. Another group of uh, cognitive illusions are the impossible figures, like the Penrose Triangle. I'm sure you have seen such figures before, but uh, keep in mind that this is a different kind of illusion compared to the bistable figures. So the impossible figures and the bistable figures, these are two different groups. There are many famous examples from Escher, an artist, um, I think he, he was from Belgium. And this is the waterfall. So water seems to run without any problems up and down, a continuous waterfall, a kind of perpetuum mobile, so a never stopping never stopping movement. There are many nice examples for impossible figures. 
this one is a newer one. So you, when you look at that, you see it's quite strange. You don't know if you look upwards. So this is up or downwards. If you look downwards, so this edge here is near, nearer to you than the windows. But if you look upwards, this edge is more far away than the windows from you. Or here, it's, uh, it's well known. Such effects are well known for a long time. And here is a, a image, a print from the 18th century where they, where they play with these uh, impossible figures. So for example, these two persons interact, although this person is in the foreground, but this person is far behind. And there are many such examples here. Also, this, this sign is here, is behind the trees, which is impossible in this situation. And this person here, fishing here, although it's uh, in the foreground, and the, the fish down there is far behind in the background. So there are many, many tricks here in this print that work with uh, impossible figures. And the next one is um, also about animation. I hope you can see that. This is, uh, it's very fascinating. It's the spinning or silhouette dancer illusion. The spinning dancer, also known as the silhouette illusion, is a kinetic, bistable optical illusion. So it's also an example of a bistable illusion. But here you have uh, animation as well. Therefore, it's kinetic. So that means there is movement. And uh, this illusion resembles a pirouetting female dancer. And uh, it was created in 2003 by the web designer Nobuyuki Kayahara, obviously from Japan. And um, the interesting thing is the direction of the motion. So some observers initially see the figure as spinning clockwise, of course, viewed from above. So if you look from above, in which direction does this uh, figure move? For me, it's clockwise, but not everyone will see it maybe that way. And it's possible to look at it again and all of a sudden you see it moving in the other direction. So now it's changed for me and I see it now counterclockwise. And the reason why we have this problem is a lack of visual cues of depth. I will talk about the different depth cues later. First of all, I will give you another version of this um, illusion where you can try it by yourself. So now, you, additionally, some depth cues are added but they are added in different ways. The original illusion is in the center. Here on the left, she is uh, spinning around clockwise. Here on the right, she's spinning around counterclockwise. If you start here watching this figure and then you go to the center, then you see it in the same way. But if you start here, looking at this side, and then you look to the center, then it's the other way around. So this proves that the figures, that the, the illusion works. And as you see here, depth cues are added with these blue and red lines. So here you see that this blue lake, you can clearly notice when the blue leg is in front of the red leg. And here it's simply colored the other way around. So 
So the two sides, the left arm, left leg, are then red, and the other is blue. And therefore, you get the opposite impression. This is the secret of this illusion. It's a very interesting, and it shows the power of depth cues. The next one is called Troxler's fading. And um, this is not an animation, this is uh, static again. And it works by fixating the black dot in the center. So you have to fixate, just look at this black dot and fix this um, image here. And if you fix it for a longer time, then you see that these colorful it's spots fading. around will start to fade. That means they become weaker and weaker. Some completely disappear. Of course, there is no change. It's a static image. And the recent research suggests that at least some portion of the perceptual phenomena associated with fading occurs in the brain. It's not so clear why this really happens. Maybe because there is no change. Our brain thinks this is not important because it's outside of the area we, we are focused to. So we focus just the center. The important thing is in the center. And if there is no movement outside, then this seems to be unimportant. And if you if you focus this spot long enough, then it's it's nearly just a, a gray area around this black spot. It's also quite interesting. The next one then is a combination. It's called a lilac chaser. It's a combination of three illusions. The first is a gap running around a circle of lilac discs. This is the phi phenomenon we have seen before. The second, a green disc running around a circle of lilac discs in place of the gap. This is the after image. And the third, the green disc running around on the gray background with the lilac discs having disappeared in sequence. So this is Troxler's fading. You can try that. So fixate the cross in the center. Just look at that point. And it's quite funny because it's a bit like a Pac-Man game. Because of this after image effect, you see the green disc. And after a while, this green disc seems to, to eat the lilac discs. But afterwards, it seems to create those discs again. So sometimes you see only the green disc moving around. Then you see again the lilac discs. And then they are eaten again and so on and so on. This uh, shows that uh, it's possible to combine some of the illusions to create interesting effects. This is the last example of the optical illusions. Related to them is the next chapter about uh, depth perception. I mentioned already the depth cues. So you have seen if you add some depth cues to the spinning girl illusion, then you can, uh, in fact, you can you can stop the illusion effect. So you see the girl spinning uh, clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on how you add the depth cues. But without them. It's an illusion because everyone can see it in another direction, or you can even switch 
between different directions. I again used material here from Keith Clark and from Colin Ware, this book that I have also uploaded for you today, and also Wikipedia. I want to start here with just a photograph of the beautiful landscape. This is in Norway, so that's a typical fjord, fjord landscape. So during the last um, ice age, there was a big glacier lying in this valley. But after the glaciers shrinked, this is an arm of the ocean here, of the North, Northern Atlantic Ocean. And you see the, the, sh the shape of the mountains here created by the huge glacier who smoothed uh, these um, slopes. And um, I want you to think a bit about the question, why do we see such a strong depth here? So we have a strong effect. We immediately we see that this is far away from us. Actually, we are looking at this two-dimensional photograph. It's just two-dimensional, but of course it recreates the impression that we have in nature. So if we would stand here on this beach, on the shoreline, and we would uh, look in this direction, we would have a very similar impression. But why do we see such uh, depth in the scene? Why it is recreated? If you think about that, then you will notice that there are several properties, several aspects that are important. So you see, for example, the sky, you see this uh, gravel on the beach, these small stones. You see also differences in colors. For example, here, if you look at these areas here, 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 the color is different. This has to do with depth and our depth impression. So in the sky, it's how the clouds are, or the impression of the clouds that we have. It's similar to the impression of, of the gravel here. Here on the beach, it's even, there are two effects here. One is the effect of the texture. This is similar to the one in the sky. So the, how to say, if those clouds would have the same size, they don't have the same size, but some have maybe similar sizes, then of course, these distances here would be quite different. They are also here in fact, but it's a bit harder to compare. This is easier on the beach because the beach is quite homogeneous, the material here. So it seems that these small stones, rocks here, uh, they are about the same size here at the shoreline directly, but also here. But we see them, we see here, we have an impression that they are larger because they are nearer. We know this from our experience. So we do not expect that they are smaller here. We expect them to be more far away, and therefore it's an information about the depth. And this is also true for the clouds, in fact. So these clouds here, they look smaller than the clouds here, but this is because they are much more far away. And uh, another aspect are these colors I mentioned. So here you have a uh, higher saturation of the green tone, here this becomes a bit bluish and the saturation is weakened because it's more far away. And uh, important are also this, this shoreline on both sides. 
So they converge somehow to a point far away. And if you're familiar with such landscape in fjords, then you know these shorelines are near to parallel. Of course, they're not exactly parallel. They are not lines, in fact, but we can approximate their shape as long lines that are more or less parallel. So here, they also seem to converge, to run towards a point far away from us. And the distance between these two lines here seems to be much larger than back there. But again, we know from our experience, that means that this area here is much more far away from us. Now, these are all depth cues, depth information within an image. And we will talk about that then um, in the third hour of today's lesson. So we have, again, break time. Till 
Let's continue then. Let's use this is our topic now. And of course, this uh, texture differences that you can see here and in the clouds, you can also see them here in these uh, forest areas. For example, here you have uh, a coarser texture compared to here. 
and it becomes finer. In detail, I will show you the different depth cues now. These are typical examples, especially on the right hand side, where you see a figure and uh, these two figures have the same size actually. But uh, the one nearer to us, because also of the setting, with these lines running towards the point far away, so we have the impression that this is uh, there is depth here, there's a distance here, and the figure that looks actually at the same size but is more far away should be much larger. So this is our experience, and. Um, here you see also this, the setting with these uh, collinear lines that are running towards um, a point somewhere far away. I first want to show you some examples that uh, work with uh, these three-dimensional perspectives. And of course, they implement many depth cues as well. These are examples from the street art by Julian Beaver. And it's, uh, yeah, it's also quite fascinating. I, uh, some of these examples are from, from Clark, who from him I know about this uh, Julian Beaver. I didn't know about him before. And um, yeah, you see here, this is the impression you have if you take a picture from a certain point, but in fact, uh, this is how the situation in reality looks like. So he adds some objects, but they are just painted. And here it's also funny if you notice here, this, this is a pole. So this is really a three dimensional object. And here it just uh, looks, they, they look very similar, these two, but that one is just uh, painted on the ground. There are yeah, more examples here. This is how it actually looks like then. Or here also funny or the similar idea here. So he uses a pole that is actually there and the rest is just painted. And of course here you have many different depth cues applied. You can later on after I have introduced the different depth cues to you, you can also check out these images and identify different depth cues that uh, have been applied in these uh, paintings, these street art paintings. This one is also a nice one. Or oh, that one here. So yeah, it's very creative it has a lot of ideas. Now, how to systematize these uh, different depth cues? There is a first big group. This is about the monocular static pictorial depth cues. Monocular, that means with one eye. That's important. Monocular with one eye. So if you just cover one eye, and you look at an image, there are some depth cues that still work and others that don't work with one eye. What works with one eye is the linear perspective. Another one, the texture gradient, the size gradient, 
occlusion. I will explain later what that is. It's very simple, just a bit complicated technical term. The depth of focus and shape from shading as well as the vertical position, relative size to familiar objects, cast shadows, aerial perspective, and accommodation, but this is a non-pictorial effect. I will explain that when we talk about accommodation. And the last one is chromostereopsis. So chromo has always something to do with color. And stereopsis is, um, yeah, it has to do with um, this depth impression. The second group are monocular dynamic depth cues. So the first, monocular static. The second, monocular dynamic. So now we have moving pictures, we have animations. So here's a movement is necessary to create a depth cube. And this one here, there is just one, it's structure from motion. It's also called kinetic depth and or motion parallax. And the last, binocular depth cues. Binocular then means you need two eyes. You need both of your eyes to see this uh, depth cues. And this is eye convergence and stereoscopic depth, also called retinal parallax. I also will explain that later. So this is the classification, three groups, monocular static, monocular dynamic, and binocular. First, the monocular static depth cues in pictures. The linear perspective. That's another example. Um, yeah, you see this linear perspective. So we have lines that are in reality parallel, but in the image, they converge towards a faraway point. And this creates a perspective, and this creates therefore also a depth impression. So these lines, they converge, therefore the distance there, it seems the, or it's, it's one band, or let's say, uh, or two lines, the edges can be seen as two lines, and the, the width of this band is smaller here than here, but from our experience, we know it's, it should be the same, but this part here is more far away. Another is the texture gradient. So I talked about that when I've, I've discussed with you this uh, image of the fjord landscape in Norway on the beach. So you have some stones here and they are about the same size. And uh, you have this gradient here, so that means the distances between or the length, it has to do with the size gradient as well, of course, but the texture gradient is especially about this uh, texture impression that you have. So size gradient works just with uh, two single objects. Texture gradient only works with a lot of objects that are about the same size. And uh, it also works in this uh, perspective on an old map, one of the uh, city in the United States, where you have a regular pattern of streets. 
and uh, then it creates also this texture because here the distances are larger between these, um, or yeah, between these rectangles or the side of the rectangles as well than here. And again, of course, this has to do with the size gradient. And here you see this, this figure here is much smaller than the, the figures here. If you copy this one to the foreground, you see how much smaller it is. But here it just looks normal. We, of course, we expect this person to be far away from us. Therefore, we are not irritated that it's much smaller. In fact, within our impression. Now, this uh, big strange term occlusion, it's a very simple concept. It simply means that there is one object hiding or covering another one, like here, these two playing cards. Because this one is hidden in part by that one, we assume that this one is in the foreground and this is in the background, and therefore it's a depth information. So that's very simple, but it's called occlusion, which is not a simple term for a simple concept. So this is used very often, like here, these stacks of um, folders, or here, these uh, different rectangles. You, we would assume, if you see this, that there is one in the background, one in the middle, and three are in the foreground. And here you see also the um, effect that uh, that occlusion can have an important input or an important um, effect on how we see a situation. If you just see these two figures, you think about the linear perspective. So they are about the same size and therefore this figure is more far away from us than that figure. But if you add this object and the occlusion effect that this figure is covered now, then you see, ah, uh, this figure is maybe much smaller. It's about maybe the distance from these two figures to, to us as the viewers of this uh, picture, it seems it's about the same, or maybe the small figure is even a bit nearer. And this is just changed uh, by this um, occlusion effect here. The depth of focus, it's also called uh, depth of field. And this uh, is a concept that is also used in photography. So those who are interested in photography can know about that. So depending on the, the distance and the uh, uh, focus of the camera, you can have a narrow depth of field or a large depth of field. So usually if you have um, um, it depends on the lenses you use on the camera. They have the different uh, properties about their, their focal length and uh, then it depends how you, you use the, um, I just think about the English terms. Um, yeah, the the opening where the light uh, enters the camera, this opening for eyes, of course, you, you can open it more, so more light enters, or you can narrow it down, and this uh, influences also the, the size of the depth of field, so if it's a narrow or large. And here, this is used, for example, to highlight certain figures in a chess game. So these others here, they seem to, or they are blurred. And uh, this blurring is the effect that we think that uh, they are more far away from us. 
this is of course here is another effect that they look a bit smaller also. So there is also a size gradient. But uh, we focus then on these two um, horses here. So it gives us depth information. This seems to be nearer. The horse seems to be nearer, the focused horse, than this uh, not focused figure. It seems to be in the background. Another one is uh, shape from shading. And um, yeah, you, you know about this, I guess. So here, it's uh, difficult to see a clear um, shape, in fact. But this uh, changes here. So we usually we assume that light comes from the upper left corner within a picture. So we think light comes somewhere from here. Therefore, if it's dark here, then this is nearer to what we would expect. Therefore, we think that these um, are convex shapes. So it's like they come out this, uh, nearer to us here. But here, this looks to be more far away. It's like uh, the part that is deepened, that is uh, cut out maybe a bit. Here, you, this effect does not really work. At least it's uh, much smaller. And here you can transfer uh, a disk to a sphere just by adding uh, shading and uh, light effects. And uh, here is more about this. So there are different kinds of, of shading. You see a sphere in all three scenes here. So you, th you see three-dimensional objects. But um, here, you see the effect is strongest. So the first here is just the so-called Lambertian shading. The second is Lambertian shading with specular and ambient shading. And the third one, C, is Lambertian shading with specular, ambient, and cast shadows. So these are the cast shadows here. They are added here. And here you see there is this uh, light point. And uh, there are different kinds of shades. This is called uh, specular, this light point. So it's specular. And this is ambient here. You see here, if you compare these two, here is a bit brighter than here. So this is called ambient shading. And uh, you see also in this visualization, the difference here is only shading. So you can create a totally different impression of an object by just manipulating the different kinds of shading. This also shows you the power of this uh, depth cube. The next one is the vertical position. So this has to do with our experience. When we look at the scene, like here with two trees, and uh, this tree here, the vertical position, if you compare the two, is higher than that one, because it's more far away. Here it is, of course, the effect is stronger. Or here. And there is also a special illusion that has to do with this uh, vertical position. This is the moon size illusion. So usually if the vertical position is higher, like here in number two, we think that the object is more far away than if uh, the vertical position is lower. And therefore, the impression of the size is influenced. It looks different.
Another one is the relative size to familiar objects. So of course, in this image, as it's, this is a photograph, so similar to the fjord example at the beginning, you have here many uh, depth cues at the same time, like for example, the clouds, the texture here of the corn field. Um, but what is most interesting here is the, the relative size to familiar objects. So you have the, the size differences here. You, so you know that these objects are about the same size. And this is uh, just the depth cue about the, the size. But you have an experience, for example, about trees and how large are trees. And so you can you can compare the familiar size of trees with those um, the size of these uh, straw balls, or they're not really balls, and more cylinders. Um, and this helps us to, to get an impression about the depth. Then the cast shadows. So this, uh, they were mentioned before in the shape of shading example, but there is a, a depth cue that's only about these uh, cast shadows like here, these two persons. And here you see the effect of these cast shadows. If there's no shadow here, for example, in that way, you would not notice that this sphere is above this area. You, you simply, you cannot know that. But with the cast shadow, you know it. So it's an important information about that here. Also here you have the shadows, of course, a strong um, linear perspective also in this image. And here is uh, more information about these different uh, shadows. What's called here reflected light, this would be ambient, what we have uh, learned in the example of uh, shape from shading. So ambient means that here is some reflected light, therefore this is a bit brighter. And here are the different parts, different degrees of shading. Here you also notice that this area is a little bit brighter. And uh, the other examples here, here you see also that this rectangle is above the ground more, the distance is higher than here. This is also above the ground, but the distance between rectangle and background is smaller. And this is just created by this cast shadow. And also that one here, this one I like, um, I especially like that one, um, because here you have four spheres lying on the on this area on the ground, and here you see different distances. But in fact, these two, the position of the spheres here and here are exactly the same in the image. The only thing that changes is here, this cast shadow. The cast shadow is on a different position, and then the spheres seem to be on different positions. So it's just done by a cast shadow. And here you have also uh, just the change in the shadow changes uh, the situation and the impression here. So here you have the cast shadow and this is called drop shadow. Aerial perspective. So we had that in the fjord image also. I, I told you about the different colors of the trees, so they become bluish and less saturated if the area is far away. So this has to do with the aerial perspective. Also here, this is a famous 
panoramic drawing of the Denali National Park in Alaska in the United States by Heinrich Behrer. And uh, you see that here the colors are more saturated in the area that is nearer to us. But here around the highest mountains, it's less saturated. So this image works with this uh, aerial perspective. And the, for, the more far away these areas are, there is more of this um, lower saturation. So the saturation is lowered more. Of course, there are also some, it's not really clouds, but there are some atmospheric atmospheric um, effects that he added. But uh, this is in fact part of the aerial perspective. Now, what is accommodation? Accommodation is the process by which the vertebrate eye changes optical power to maintain a clear image or focus on an object as it, its distance varies. In these distances vary for individuals from the far point, the maximum distance from the eye for which a clear image of an object can be seen, to the near point, the minimum distance for a clear image. And uh, what is optical power? Optical power, also referred to as dioptric power, refractive power, focusing power, or convergence power, is the degree to which a lens, mirror, or other optical system converges or diverges, or diverges, converges or diverges light. So what's going on in our eye? Accommodation. Um, maybe you remember that I have mentioned that around our lenses in the eye, there are some small muscles. And uh, some of these muscles are there to, to move the eyeball, so they are outside of the eyeball. But they are muscles that also can um, yeah, stretch, like here, stretch the shape of the lens. So here, this difference of the shape of the lens is important because this helps us to focus on different distances. So if something is near, we change the focus to see it sharp. And if it's more far away, then we also change the focus. And this is done, in fact, by a change in the shape of our lenses in the eye. So here you see that these brown areas are these muscles. And these muscles um, are used to change the focus and um, the interesting thing is that you can do this with just one eye. So you can hide or cover one eye, and uh, with the other one, you can still do that. So you can focus on things that are near to you or on things that are far away. And therefore, accommodation is a monocular static uh, depth cue. So these two uh, images show the same thing, but here you see uh, that something is in focus. Here is a near point, and uh, here is the, the faraway point. So it depends which of these rays, light rays, uh, meet exactly back there at the retina. As you know, here are the sensors, and um, here the information is then further processed. So it, the information needs to, or the, the rays need to meet exactly there at the retina. Then it's focused. Otherwise, it's not. It's just it's blurred. And this is called accommodation. So our eye can accommodate to the distance of objects. And therefore, this information gives 
is further processed and our brain then knows based on the accommodation of the eye of an object is if an object is more far away or nearer to us. And again, you just need one eye for this. It's monocular. Another one, this is a weaker one, so the depth impression is not so strong. It is called chromostereopsis. But uh, yeah, don't get confused. Uh, the term stereo is usually used if two eyes are involved. But here stereo is used because there is some uh, depth illusion or effect here. But it's just based on the colors. So you have already learned about the chromatic aberration. So the different focal length of uh, blue and red because of the different wavelength of these uh, um, colors. So some people see red nearer than blue and other people see the other way around. And another group of people, they don't see any different difference here. So for me, uh, in this example here, red seems to be nearer than blue. And therefore, for me, chromostereopsis works at least a bit. It's not a strong effect, but there is some effect for me. But again, maybe you see it in a different way. So for some people, blue is nearer than red. Other people think they are about the same distance from us or they are in the same level. And uh, for about 60% of observers, the red appears closer. So I'm one of this 60%. But 30% see the reverse, for them blue is nearer and the remaining 10% see the colors lying in the same plane. And of course, brightness contrast also plays a role here because there is more contrast between red and black and between this relatively dark blue and black. So it's not just about color, color U, it's also about uh, the color brightness. Now the second group, these are now the monocular dynamic and there is just one, so it's uh, not step Qs, it's just step Q. And uh, it is called structure from motion. And um, if you close one eye, you will still get this impression because um, there are, you see now these objects from different angles. So you get an impression about the shape of the objects and um, how they are oriented and placed in this um, scene. So you get the depth impression from that, but of course there are many other uh, depth cues working here. So you have the linear perspective, you have occlusion, so from one perspective, uh, one of these uh, cubes is hiding a certain uh, sphere from another angle. Uh, it, it doesn't hide it and so on. So there is a change in, in several depth cues here. There are also shading effects here, of course. Um, but the, the most important thing is that you see the objects from different angles. And therefore you need this motion here. This is the information that is added because of the motion. And therefore, there is a, this is a separate depth cue. And the last group, there are two. This is about the binocular depth cues. And they only work with both eyes. So you need two eyes to see them. Now this is the eye convergence first. And of course, 
So you need two eyes so they can converge. If you have just one eye, uh, it's no need to, to converge. And therefore, um, it doesn't work with one eye. But you see, there's also accommodation. But accommodation is a different depth cue. Again, accommodation works with just one eye. You can easily check that. But eye convergence does not. So everyone can try that if you like. Uh, if you focus on something that's very near to you, then you have a stronger eye convergence. And this movement of the eyes, the eyeballs, so in eye, this eye convergence, the whole eyeball is moving. And of course, accommodation plays a role because if an object is near to you, to focus on that object, you need also accommodation. So the two things work together. But while eye convergence works with both eyes, accommodation works also with only one eye. So it's uh, defined as the simultaneous inward movement of both eyes toward each other, usually in an effort to maintain single binocular vision when viewing an object. Single means that you process um, with two eyes simultaneously the scene. So you have then one, you have impression of one as usual as one image. And the other one is stereoscopic depth. It's also called retinal parallax. And this is, um, yeah, it's a bit more complicated. And uh, the term stereo comes from here. So with this chromostereopsis. But again, don't get confused. Chromostereopsis, you can see or not see with, with one eye. So if it works for you, then you can see it also with just one eye. But stereoscopic depth here, you can only see with two eyes. It's also called stereoscopics or stereo imaging. And it is a technique for creating or enhancing the illusion of depth in an image by means of stereopsis for binocular vision with two eyes. Any stereoscopic image is called a stereogram. Originally, stereogram referred to a pair of stereo images which could be viewed using a stereoscope. Maybe you have tried that. This is a simple one. So it's, uh, for example, it's used in remote sensing. If you have two aerial images from slightly different perspectives and you look at them side by side, you can use such a stereoscope and then you get a three-dimensional impression. So you can see, for example, here is a mountain and here is a valley and so on. There are different, um, more sophisticated ones. This on the left hand side this is the most simple version, I, I guess. And um, yeah, here is such a pair of images. So if you use such images, they are from a slightly different perspective. So at the moment, they look exactly the same, but they are not there is a slight difference between them. And if you look at these two images with actually white, then you can see this uh, stereoscopic depth. So you can see here, for example, that this uh, flat land area is nearer to you than the sea. So you see the difference in depth. Most stereoscopic methods present two offset images separately to the left and right eye of the viewer to emulate the retinal parallax. This is what just happened with these two images that I have shown to you. It's also called retinal disparity or binocular disparity. 
these two-dimensional images are then combined in the brain to give the perception of 3D depth, three-dimensional depth. This technique is distinguished from 3D displays that display an image in three full dimensions, allowing the observer to increase information about the three-dimensional objects being displayed by head and eye movements. So here you have also this um, effect here. You know that if you can, you can use your thumb, and take a look, and then um, it, it jumps when you focus something that is more far away. If you look at it through the left eye or the right eye, so from that eye, it seems that this uh, thumb here is left of the tree. So this is what you what is in the image here is what you would see through your right eye. But through your left eye, it's just the other way around. Then it's on the other side. And this difference, you can even compute the distance that the tree is away from you with the help of this uh, parallax. Or here, it's, uh, it described what's going on. Each eye captures a slightly different image, and the difference between these images acts as a cue for depth distance. So the two eyes, they simply have different perspectives on the real world, because they, the two eyes, they are simply at different locations. And um, these two images are combined then and uh, give us a three-dimensional impression. So here you, you see what the right eye would see, and here is what the left eye would see. And this information is then combined in our brain. And there are different techniques. There is um, the anaglyph technique, anaglyph 3D. The stereoscopic 3D effect is achieved by means of encoding each eye's image using filters of different colors, usually chromatically opposite. Chromatically opposite means, for example, blue and red, or cyan and red, to be exact. Such glasses, I'm sure you have tried that. Um, so one, you, you get one image for the left eye and one from the, from the for the right eye, and uh, these two images are shown with this slight difference in perspective, and therefore they emulate the parallax. So it's like printing two slightly different images uh, together, and one, as you see, is in in cyan and one is in red, and you see always the other one uh, with these glasses. So through the cyan uh, part of the glasses, this uh, blocks here the, the red part because they together um, the chromatically opposite ones. And therefore you see then the other color. And for the other eyes, the other way around. And the effect is then the same. You get through two slightly different perspectives for your two eyes, and this um, gives you the impression of a three-dimensional object. And this can also be done with uh, topographic maps, like in this example. And uh, yes, time is over for today, and uh, therefore I want to finish here. I hope it's interesting for you, at least in part. If you have any questions, please let me know. Um, I will continue next week. Uh, before, so end of this week, I will send you a new file with examination materials so that you can um, proceed learning and preparing for the final exam.
So thank you for your interest. I wish you a nice day and a nice rest of the week. Take take care and um, stay um, in healthy condition. Thank you.